Chapter 14 The Man and the Saint From the time of his ordination, and practically until the end of 1887, Don Bosco led a life of tremendous activity, and in the preceding pages some attempts have been made to describe the varied nature of his many undertakings and the development of his great work for boys. Yet, the very multitude of his activities and his devotion to the principal object of the oratory that he founded appear to operate in combination to prevent our seeing him. The man disappears behind the great edifice that he erected. It is time for us to endeavour to bring him more clearly into focus, to see him for what he was, to gather together the various indications which appeared in his early life while he was still at home, and see how their development influenced his adult life and, with God's grace, turned him into a saint. It is, of course, a common practice in hagiography to attempt to dissect the saints, to endeavour to take them to pieces, as it were, and to discover what makes them what they are. Too often the process, though possibly interesting and instructive in many ways, fails to achieve its purpose. Then there is frequently an attempt to systemise the saint's teaching, to construct a neat and comprehensive scheme with causally divided compartments where all is docketed and classified so that what was a living body becomes nothing but dry bones, a mere textbook treatment that is not always suited to every case. With Don Bosco it can be said at once such methods do not succeed at all. His work, his teaching methods, his whole organization of the oratory in Valdocco, on the pattern of which others were formed, all grew up under his hand, gradually but according to no rigid, well-devised plan. The end in view was always clearly seen. The means were left to be improvised as occasion and circumstances demanded. His personal religious life, his attitude to prayer, for example, was after the same pattern. No complications, no carefully worked out stages, no schematic treatment, but an attractive simplicity that made it a natural occupation and the one that he practised not only at regular times, but continually throughout the day. So also, in examining the man and his ideas on education and Christian life, we have to be careful not to put him into a straitjacket. Instead of fitting him, will only turn him into a dummy figure. The fact is that he was an extraordinary mixture. He was no mere theorist, but displayed great common sense, and yet all his schemes were conceived on such a grand scale that to one unacquainted with all the facts they often seem like madness. But his native prudence was always at work, and the proof of this is to be found in this. All his schemes were brought to successful completion within a relatively short time. As we have seen, he founded his oratory and his congregation, he built the basilica in Turin, from the slenderest of resources, and these represent by no means all his achievements. And he was able to do this because he was a realist. He saw straight. He looked first, always, to the utility of the proposed undertaking. Was it necessary? Did it fulfil a purpose in accordance with his own clearly seen vocation? If those questions could be answered in the affirmative, then he proceeded straight to his objective. His whole energy was deployed to effect what he was convinced formed part of God's purpose for him. It was this acute sense of vocation that lay at the origin of his calmness when things appeared to go wrong. We have had examples of this. For instance, 
the building of the Church of Our Lady Havre of Christians in Turin. He never worried when the money ran out. He was sure it was part of his work in this world to build that church. If, then, he did all in his power to bring it to pass, God would do the rest. His calmness in adversity of all sorts was founded on his great trust in God. To the same source can be ascribed his persistent good humour. He was always happy, agreeing with St. Francis of Sales that a sad saint is a sorry saint. In his dealings with boys, in guiding his Salesians in the running of the great establishment that the oratory became, he laid great stress on true Christian joy, founded on the possession of a clear conscience, a proper use of creatures of this world, and on joyful freedom of the sons of God. To say that he possessed a fundamental goodness of heart, a kindliness that was never failing, is but to give a poor description of what was predominant in his life. It has often been remarked that he exerted no extraordinary attraction over the young. The boys took to him and trusted him ever afterwards. No doubt this attraction was in part a natural quality, but it is often hard to discern whether, on a last analysis, we are confronted with a mere gift of nature or a quality that is an outward expression of exceptional virtue. It is certain that Don Bosco loved all his boys and that he never tried to hide his love under a grim exterior. His whole method of education, in so far as he had a method, was founded on that, because he loved his boys and with the uncanny perception of the young they could perceive it clearly from their first contact with him. He found his love returned. His boys loved him, and that was the secret of his success. He could lead them rather than urge them on from behind. As one of his former pupils put it, everything in him seemed ordinary, quite ordinary, yet he could have led us wherever he wanted. It must have been God who spoke to us through him and bound us to the man. If you go to Turin, you can still see there at the Salesian Mother House, the room with its balcony at the corner of the quadrangle looking towards the little church of St. Francis de Sales and down onto the playground used by those first pupils of the relatively small establishment that was there in Don Bosco's early days. You can see his room and the chapel and his books and his poor humble possessions displayed and ticketed. You can inspect the simple bedstead of or the small pulpit-like affair from which he used to give short good-night talk to his boys. You may examine the letters and manuscripts in that characteristic but by no means easy hand, written in haste possibly when the rest of the house was sleeping. You can see the specially posed photographs taken afterwards, ne memoria periat, of his habitual manner of hearing boys' confessions, of his arm around the penitent's shoulder, the boy's head on his heart, of those early days when the oratory was a Sunday occasion and confession took place in the fields before Don Bosco led his boys to some church for Mass. In those rooms, in the mother house, his memory is still very vivid. So remarkable an impression has he left upon his surroundings. It requires little imagination to picture him there still. Yet all this gives us a little real clue to the man himself. We can imagine him only exteriorly. We cannot see his inner life, which furnished, so to say, the motive power of all that he accomplished in a busy, active life, and led him not only to success in great undertakings, but crowned his achievements with the aureole of sanctity. In his case, as in of all the saints, what distinguished him, what conferred on his life 
an equality that is uncommon was his absorption in God. The work that he did and all the activities that he undertook with such signal success were the fruit of this secret inner life which was hidden from the world. At his funeral, Cardinal Alimonda summed it up admirably. The inward and divine virtue, which was the mainspring of this wonderful life, was heavenly charity. Because he was a realist and came from peasant stock, he knew the true meaning of humility. Several characteristic utterances furnish light on this. What was the finest thing you ever saw? He once asked a boy during recreation. Don Bosco was the immediate answer. You remind me, replied Don Bosco, of a good peasant who came to look at the prizes in our last lottery. While everyone else was admiring some work of art, he stood with his eyes fixed on a huge sausage. He could see nothing finer than that. Don Bosco never made any secret of his humble origins. When he was being lionized in Paris, he delighted in recalling them. Do you remember, he asked a close friend, the little path to the right, running up from the road to Boutelliera and leading to a little hill? On the hill, a poor cottage with a bit of a field below it. That is my mother's house, and in that field I used to tend two cows. All these fine people who have today overwhelmed me with compliments never think for a moment that they are honouring a former cowherd. One of the Lenten collects speaks of self-denial repairing the dignity of human nature, which has been harmed by excess. Penance, in other words, is medicinal. It seems, therefore, something of, in the nature of a paradox that the lives of the saints should exhibit so many instances of what appears to us to be almost an excess of penitential practice. The vicarious nature of some of this must be borne in mind, of course. The saints were following our Lord's example, enunciated clearly in St. John's Gospel, Pro eius scientifico me ipsum. It is certain, too, that there is no sanctity without penance. Don Bosco's spirit of penance is characteristic of the man. The essentials are present, of course, but there is an absence of fuss, a naturalness about it that is apt to deceive the unwary into thinking that it held no importance in his life. It is only by looking closer that we can observe how untrue such a supposition is. Consider the manner of his daily existence. For upwards of forty years he kept the resolution made at his ordination to manage with five hours sleep at night. Frequently he took even less. He never bothered about his food, eating simply what was put before him. Because he was often kept by long hours in the confessional interviews or business of one sort or another, on arriving late for meals, he would find that his dinner or supper had dried up to nothing in the oven, or else it had been forgotten. It can all be summed up neatly enough by saying he put up with things in his daily life. He did not complain of the great part of the day that had to be given to the many who came to interview him on all sorts of affairs. How often people must have wasted his precious time! nor did he complain of his long hours in the confessionals. There, he knew, his time was not being wasted, but in mere physical endurance, what he went through in a long and fruitful ministry is almost incredible. He certainly shortened his life by continual efforts to find money for all his undertakings, and those of others as well. Witness the Church of the Sacred Heart in Rome. He gave himself unsparingly, in spite of illness and infirmity. His eyes and leg troubles have already been mentioned. 
they made no difference to his activity, save that he accomplished in the space of a day what would take most healthy men several. He never resorted to instruments of penance, for his daily life provided him with occasion enough and to spare. From 1845 until the day of his death, he suffered constantly and uncomplainingly from eczema, so that when his body was being prepared for burial, that perpetual torment that he had borne was revealed, provoking this comment from one of the Salesians, What a hair shirt! And do you think that he always kept it concealed? The more positive side of holiness is founded, of course, on charity. Don Bosco's love of God, which found expression in love of his neighbour, humility of a genuine kind, and above all, a confidence in God that appeared boundless, these were the ingredients of an uncommon sanctity. It was no cloistered virtue, that is surely clear from the account of his life work, but neither was it tinged to any degree with activism, the pitfall awaiting those given to good works whose lives are not based on the foundation of prayer. People sometimes express a preference for saints whose lives were led amid the bustle of life in the world, rather than for those who achieved sanctity in the tranquility of monastic life or of the hermit's cell. They prefer, they would assert, a St. Vincent de Paul to a St. Bruno, a St. Francis Cabrini to St. Clare. Such ideas are doubtless legitimate, but are frequently based on the wrong reasons. There is the underlying notion that St. Vincent de Paul or St. Francis Cabrini were out in the world doing good and were not always praying and intent on their own sanctification. It is forgotten that it is precisely because they were always at their prayers that they did the good that they achieved. Certainly it was so with Don Bosco. Because there is no evidence in his life of mystical phenomena, levitation, ecstasy and the like, it would be unwise to conclude that his prayer was less intense than that of those who experienced such things. No doubt his life can be seen as an illustration of the old maxim, laborare est orare, but his interpretation of it shows it in a truer light. His work, besides being always for God, was never apart from God, for he was continually praying. His secretary testified of him that for 25 years he had been a witness of his perfect union of soul with God. His work, writes Father O'Frey, was done under God's eyes and for them only, and the manifold occupations of his hustled days, far from destroying his serenity, only bound his heart more closely to its source of light and strength and love, Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary and their servant never ceased feeling them at his side. His inner life was hidden, and he naturally spoke of it very little. Only occasionally did he afford a little glimpse to those who were intimate with him, generally in order to help them or to infuse courage into them when they were dispirited or worried about some gigantic enterprise that he had undertaken and that appeared to them impossible of achievement. He wanted his followers to trust in God as he did. Thus, on one occasion, he spoke of his great responsibilities that, to most other people, would have seemed overwhelming. Mine is indeed an alarming responsibility. What a fearful account I shall have to render to God for all the graces he has given me. And he goes on to assert that it is through Our Lady's intervention that he has been able to distinguish between foolhardiness and a willingness to undertake some great work because it formed part of his vocation here on earth. It can be said of Don Bosco that he sees clearly and that the Blessed Virgin leads him step by step. At every moment and in every circumstance 
It is she who appears. It is she who visibly protects us from all dangers, shows us what we are to do and helps us to carry it out. When, in the closing years of his life, Don Bosco travelled in France and Spain, he was everywhere attended by crowds who hung on his words, endeavoured to obtain a relic and behaved in every way as earlier in the century the crowds had behaved at ours. On both occasions the reason was the same. Both the Curé d'Ars and Don Bosco enjoyed the reputation of sanctity and were known to work miracles. In the latter's case they are perhaps more startling than those performed by St. John Vianney, but both have this in common. Their acts occurred in relatively recent times. Records were kept so that the evidence could be scrutinised and sifted as indeed it was, before there was any opportunity for a legend to grow up which, though possibly founded on fact, so embroidered on it that the truth was hard to discern. Don Bosco in particular had not yet suffered from this disadvantage which is common in the lives of the saints. The evidence is clear and rests in many cases on the testimony of witnesses actually present at the time. In examining some of the more outstanding instances of extraordinary occurrences in his life, it is perhaps necessary to point out that their importance does not lie primarily in their wonderful nature, but in what they signify. Miracles are not to be separated from their religious context, for it is this which endows them with their true meaning for us. In Don Bosco's life, we can see them as a confirmation of his mission. From one point of view, the saint is the man sent by God for a particular purpose, just as were the prophets in the Old Testament. Don Bosco's life cannot be considered apart from his mission, for the one is dependent on the other. The miracles that are to be encountered in his life are all, therefore, related to his mission. Then, too, they should be seen as striking evidence of his trust in God. Sometimes, indeed, more wonderful than the miracle itself is the faith of the man who, in particular circumstances, can say with utter conviction, God will help us. That, at least, is the striking side of more than one example of the marvellous in Don Bosco's life. There was the occasion, for instance, when the supply of bread ran out at breakfast time. It occurred in 1860. A youth of the name of Dalmazzo, on the point of leaving the oratory, had decided to make his confession to Don Bosco for the last time. There were many for confession that morning, and young Dalmazzo's turn did not come until the rest of the community were going to breakfast. He was just beginning his confession when one of his companions came and whispered to Don Bosco that there was no bread for breakfast. He told him to ask the bursar whose responsibility it was. A few moments later, the same youth returned, saying that the whole place had been ransacked and only a few rolls could be found. All right then, rejoined Don Bosco, run and tell the baker to bring what we want. But the baker, it appeared, required first the payment of his account, which ran into some hundreds of pounds. I see, came the answer. Very well. Put into the basket what you have been able to collect, and God will send the rest. I'll come and give it out at once. Dalmazzo was struck particularly by the words, God will send the rest, and followed Don Bosco to the side door of the chapel, to see what he would do. He paid special attention because he had heard some talk beforehand of the wonderful things done by Don Bosco. I found a place, he related, where I could overlook the scene, just behind Don Bosco, who was preparing to distribute the rolls to the 300 youths as they filed up. I fixed my eyes on the basket at once and I saw that it contained 15 or 20 rolls at the most. 
Meanwhile, Don Bosco carried out the distribution, and to my great surprise, I saw the same quantity remain which had been there from the first, though no other rolls had been brought, and the basket had not been changed. The impression made on the young Dalmazzo's mind was so great that instead of returning home that morning, as he had intended, he remained at the oratory, became a Salesian, and was the first rector of the parish of the Sacred Heart in Rome. A similar incident occurred on another occasion towards the end of Don Bosco's life. He was accustomed to give a short talk once a week to those in their final course of humanities. On the 1st of January 1886, the boys offered him their good wishes for the new year. There were about 35 of them. In thanking them, he bewailed the fact that he had nothing to give them. As he said this, he was looking about on his table and suddenly espied a small paper bag with some nuts in it. He thrust it in his hand and gave a handful to the boy nearest to him and then to the next. The other boys began to smile, for they could see very soon that the nuts would run out. But they did not run out, and all received as many as they could hold in both hands cupped together. When all had thus received a share, someone remarked that there were three or four boys absent. At once Don Bosco thrust his hand afresh and drew out generous shares for those who were away. One of the boys who was present on this remarkable occasion commented afterwards, Where he obtained them from, I cannot tell. The bag was quite empty. A similar phenomenon in connection with the Eucharist occurred one morning at Mass. It was the feast of Our Lady's Nativity, and about 600 boys were present in church. The ciborium in the tabernacle was almost empty, containing at most 20 particles. The sacristan had prepared another for consecration, but at the last moment forgot all about it and left it in the sacristy. Too late, he remembered it after the consecration, when nothing could be done. At the communion, when Don Bosco uncovered the ciborium and perceived the state of affairs, his expression plainly showed his distress. He seemed to raise his eyes to heaven in mute supplication, and then went down to give communion to the first row. But one row succeeded another, and still there were hosts in the ciborium, and when all the boys had communicated, most of those present did so, there were still as many particles remaining there as had been at the beginning. The sacristan was puzzled in the extreme. The varied nature of the extraordinary happenings in Don Bosco's life and their very number prevents a complete catalogue of every one of them being given here. There were cures, conversions, and foretelling the future in a way that again recalls the curé d'Ars. But perhaps the most astounding event of a miraculous nature was the case of a son of an innkeeper whose place of business was near the oratory in Turin. This boy, aged about 15 at the time, was one of those who attended Don Bosco's first oratory in 1849. The lad fell ill, and on the doctor's advice, the priest was sent for. The boy had asked for Don Bosco, but as he was away, the parish priest came and administered the last sacraments. The boy died. Next day, after a disturbed and unhappy 24 hours, constantly he was calling for Don Bosco. When Don Bosco returned to Turin, he was informed of the boy's great anxiety to see him, and he hurried to the house, only to be told by the servant that the patient had died six hours previously. He's only asleep, replied Don Bosco. The man's expression showed what he thought of this remark, but the parents confirmed the news, and Don Bosco went to the room where the corpse was laid out. The boy's mother and aunt were praying by the bed. A sheet covered the body, and the face was veiled in muslin. 
Don Bosco seems to have had a premonition that the boy's last confession was a bad one. He prayed fervently for a few minutes and then called out twice, Charles, Charles, arise. The body seemed to tremble. Abruptly, Don Bosco tore aside the shroud and uncovered the face. How strangely they have arranged me, said the lad, whose eyes, wide open now, looked as if he had just awakened from a deep sleep. Seeing Don Bosco, he cried out at once, Don Bosco, Don Bosco, if only you knew how I called out for you. You must have been sent by God. You did well to wake me up. Speak, Charles, replied Don Bosco. I am here for you alone. The boy told his sorry tale of how at his last confession he had omitted a sin committed a few weeks beforehand. I've just had a dream, he went on. I thought I was on the edge of a fiery furnace, pursued by a pack of demons who wanted to catch me. They were on the point of doing so when a lady of noble countenance came between me and their fury. Let him alone, she said. He has not yet been judged. At these words, a terrible anguish seized me, but at that moment I heard you call and awoke. And now, Father, please hear my confession. Both mother and aunt, terrified at the scene that was enacted before their eyes, at a sign from Don Bosco, left the room. They returned with the rest of the family when the confession was over. Don Bosco has saved me from hell, murmured the boy. He lived for two hours more, fully conscious, but his limbs remained like marble. Don Bosco, at last, asked him whether, now that he was in a state of grace and sure of his salvation, he would prefer to stay on earth or to die. I want to go to heaven, replied the boy. Farewell, then, till we meet in paradise, said Don Bosco. The boy's head fell gently back on the pillow. He closed his eyes and at this time fell asleep in the Lord. This extraordinary occurrence was related by Don Bosco on several occasions, first to the boys of the Turin Oratory and then at the other Salesian houses, but he always told it as if it had happened to a third person, though many suspected from the circumstantial manner of the narrative that it had really happened to Don Bosco himself. One day in 1882, when, speaking after night prayers to the boys at the Salesian College of Borgo San Martino, carried away by his story, he so far forgot himself as to lapse into the first person, then perceiving his error, returned to the impersonal narrative for the rest of the story. But he had said enough for it to be known with certainty that it was indeed he who had been concerned. The power of miracles was not one that Don Bosco found easy to bear. Rather did he appear to be crushed by the weight of it. He made use of it because he felt impelled to do so, but he ascribed everything to the power of Our Lady Help of Christians. To one of his Salesians, who was saying that if only he had the power of miracles, he would be able to convert many sinners, Don Bosco showed his mind on the matter. Hold your peace, he replied, looking serious and thoughtful. If you had the gift, you would soon be begging heaven with tears to take it away. Emphasis on the miraculous tends to obscure one side of the saint's character and work. The marvels that occur in their lives must be related to complete the picture, but they are not the only, nor always the most important, factor in their lives. Don Bosco's importance rests, in the first place, on the holiness of his life and on the example that he gave at a period when such an example was most needed. Like all the saints, he was a man with a message for his own times. In the next place, he is important for what he achieved. The great educational work that he inaugurated and developed 
whose progress has been summarily traced in the preceding chapters. It is necessary, therefore, at this point to speak of his educational methods. Yet here again we are faced with the difficulty that he refused to fit into any neatly contrived scheme. He remarked once, when asked what his system was, and it was a remarkable question in view of the excellent results that he had obtained, that he had none. My system, my system, he explained, but I don't know it myself. I have only one merit, to go ahead as God and circumstances inspired me. Nevertheless, Don Bosco did draw up a small treatise on education, which he incorporated in his rules for the Salesian Institute. It gives, so to say, the dry bones of his methods. He called his system the preventive method, as opposed to the repressive method, based on punishment. In his view, evil was to be dried up as the source of cutting off the occasion, or by neutralising it, or by putting boys on their guard against it. Similarly, when questioned about the formation of his teachers, he replied in characteristic fashion that he threw his dog in the water to teach him to swim. As Father Offre remarks, his book was his life. He lived out his educational system after becoming steeped in it by experience. The truth is that, like the oratory, the Salesian congregation, the technical schools, the secondary schools, the festive oratory, and everything else that he accomplished, his educational system was a masterpiece of improvisation. There was nothing complicated about him. He saw a need, and he filled it to the best of his ability. And because he always gave himself wholeheartedly to what he was doing, seeing it as God's work, he succeeded to a measure that to us, looking back, and remembering the means of his disposal and the starting point of his career seems another miracle and the greatest of them all. His system then was a living one, a living pedagogy, which was not acquired but a gift of God. As others are born artists or orators, Don Bosco was a born teacher, which is perhaps another way of saying that he was a born leader. The quality emerged clearly enough when he was a boy, among his fellows, at Becky or Chieri. It developed considerably after his ordination, and until the end of his life he exercised what can only be called a magnetic influence over the young. This was one of the secrets of his success. He demonstrated the source of this influence one day in 1858, during his first visit to Rome, when he was talking to Cardinal Tosti, on the best way of bringing up children. You can do nothing with them, he told the Cardinal, unless you win their confidence and their love. But how is it to be won? By bringing the children into touch with oneself, by breaking through all the hindrances that keep them at a distance. We must accommodate ourselves to their tastes. We must make ourselves like them. The Cardinal, however, was not convinced and to prove his point, Don Bosco put his theories into practice straight away. Together, the pair drove to the Piazza del Popolo. Don Bosco got out of the carriage and went up to a gang of boys playing there. They began to run away, but he called them back. Hesitatingly at first, they came. He gave them something, a sweet, a nut, talked to them a little about their families, encouraged them to go on with their game, and soon, tucking up his cassock about his waist, was playing with them. Others joined them, and at no time at all, it seemed, Don Bosco was on intimate terms with them all. Quite naturally, he said a few friendly words to them, inquiring whether they said their prayers, and ever went to confession. When it was time for him to go, they tried to retain him, finally accompanying him back to his carriage, with much vocal enthusiasm for the friendly priest who had so suddenly come among them. He was putting into practice his early resolutions that as a priest he would not 
imitate the aloof attitude that he himself experienced as a boy in Castel Nuovo and Chieri. His concept of an educator was one who shared the life of his charges. In his establishments, he insisted on constant supervision, but it was the supervision of family life. He expected his Salesians to follow his own example, as far as possible to be always with the boys, sharing their games and pastimes. Rules were to be kept, though there were as few of them as possible, not from any fear of the consequences of breaking them. Don Bosco's example was that of a father among his children, rather than an invigilator who kept order by severity and held his charges at a distance. In this way, the heart of the pupil was won, with the result that he remained attached to his master all his life, and by reason of this attachment, the influence of master over pupil was great. Of course, boys sometimes broke rules and merited punishment, and on occasion severity was called for. Don Bosco was quite clear on this matter of punishment. Above all, care must be taken not to harden the boy's heart. He must remain subject to further educative influence. Don Bosco laid down the punishment that it must be deferred as far as possible. It was to be neither humiliating nor irritating, but reasonable and prompted by kindness with an appeal to the boy's heart. Public punishments he did not encourage, and he wanted none at all for slight misdemeanours which were the result of forgetfulness. There was to be no fixed scale, no uniform rule to be applied without regard for the decree of the culprit's offence. Don Bosco envisaged the kind of slight punishment inflicted by a father in his family, an appreciation of deep disapproval, a show of coldness on occasion, a rebuke which the offender could understand and accept. Punishment was beneficially held when the boy perceived its reasonable nature. For boys, he said, everything may be used as a punishment, which they regard as such. A word of praise to one who has deserved it, a word of blame to one who has forgotten himself, may often be a real reward or a real punishment. The constant supervision, the sharing of life by master and pupil alike, is a system that appears strange to English eyes. We are inclined to look on it as spying, and what amounts to the same thing, an absence of trust on the part of the masters in regard to their charges. It is important to realise that Don Bosco, heir to a very different tradition, could hardly have been expected to introduce into his house the public school system of England. Nevertheless, his views on the matter of supervision must not be misunderstood as a repressive method of discipline which, in practice, is frequently nothing else than a concern for order for its own sake. He understood discipline in quite another way. To him, it was a form of leadership, forming disciples, followers. It was to encourage a certain spontaneity in the relations between master and boy, a proper familiarity which should lead the young to feel that in times of difficulty they could approach their masters for help. The boys were to be led rather than driven, and were to be given that indispensable collaboration which would enable them one day to do without it, and with all that went respect for the boy's freedom. The results of these methods are to be seen to advantage especially in the religious education given to Don Bosco's pupils. The practice of religion was made as attractive as possible, and boys were encouraged to communicate frequently. Fifty years before St. Pius X's decree on the subject, Don Bosco was preaching the same thing. But boys were not herded together to the sacraments, general communion days, confession by classes at fixed times, 
and all the rest. All were free in these matters. Don Bosco's principle was Fenelon's. Try to make the young delight in God, and he endeavoured to render the chapel and its services attractive to them, a place of prayer and happiness. He saw clearly that chapel and classroom were closely connected. Religious instruction in class was not isolated from worship in chapel, nor from life in general, by being divided off into a watertight compartment on its own. Catechism, short readings after Mass, the good night talks after night prayers, which were not held in chapel, but wherever the boys were, to accustom them to the idea of praying elsewhere than in church, and other specific religious instruction were connected with whatever was encountered in other branches, a passage from Virgil, some episode in Italian history, a well-known piece of Italian literature, could all serve not to point the moral, but to drive home the truths taught in catechism and the rest. A boy's religion was to be made a living body of truth, which should stand by him in after years, and not a kind of religious geometry, which was forgotten when he left school, because he could not connect it with daily life. Religion thus became something that was attractive, and the reverse of irksome and boring. The keynote of Don Bosco's religious teaching was simplicity. It was to be seen especially in the three principal practices that he counselled, and indeed insisted upon throughout his life as a priest. We have already encountered his emphasis on frequent communion. To this must be added his continual exhortation to frequent confession and devotion to Our Lady. It has been said that, after the Cure d'Ars, Don Bosco probably heard more confessions than any other priest of his time. Such statements are difficult of proof, but it is quite certain that he heard more than most. Huysmans paints a true picture of him when he says, He heard confessions in church, in the open air, in the corner of a room, and it is on record that this wonderful priest heard confessions in the field that he had rented when one lord after another had turned him out of their houses. He used to sit on a little mound, and not far off, in a circle round him, the boys were kneeling and preparing to confess their unshriven sins. And we see Don Bosco, with his country priest's cheery countenance, taking the penitent who has finished his examination with his arm around his neck and laying the boy's head lightly against his heart. He was no longer now a judge, but a father, helping his son to make the confession that is often so painful, even in the case of the least of sins. That he inculcated devotion to Our Lady goes without saying. From his earliest years, it had been predominant in his life. He learnt it from his mother and preached it all his life, following her injunction given when he was a youth. If ever you become a priest, propagate devotion to Our Lady. And three days before his death, he told his followers that from the pulpit and in private conversations, they should do all in their power to promote frequent communion and devotion to Our Lady. Don Bosco's method of teaching religion was in advance of his times, as were his technical schools and festive oratories. And he was an innovator educationally in other ways as well. Thus it will be remembered that he wrote plays for his boys to act, and as early as 1847 set up a stage and was encouraging them to produce entertainments which should add a certain element of joy to the routine of school life. In those days, in Latin countries at least, Catholic educators looked askance at the theatre. Monsignor Dupanlou, for instance, Don Bosco's contemporary, regarded it with some alarm. And he was an innovator in another respect. Long before others, he had started the practice 
he was taking his boys every autumn to what can only be called a holiday camp. The practice had begun when, without buildings of his own, he led his boys on a day's excursion to the surrounding countryside. From this, in after years, developed what Don Bosco called his autumn excursions. They were always homely affairs. At first, he took his boys to Becky, leaving Turin towards the end of September. The first nine days were spent on his brother's farm. There, Don Bosco preached the novena preparatory to the Feast of the Rosary, which is on the first Sunday of October, for the peasants in the neighbourhood. The little chapel at Becky, put together by Don Bosco, may still be seen. It holds about 30 persons. The sermons were preached outside from an improvised pulpit. At one time, an upturned wine barrel was used, and on one occasion, Don Caliero, waxing eloquent, gestured too forcefully, and the bottom of the barrel collapsed beneath his feet. He disappeared temporarily from view in the middle of his sermon. The novena over, the party left for the rest of the excursion, visiting a whole district, entertained by Don Bosco, who could make an object lesson of almost anything encountered en route. In the early days, there were thirty or so boys. As the year went by, this number increased until he took with him more than a hundred. His object was primarily to avoid the dangers that the long holidays offered to boys of poor or unsatisfactory parents, to give those from large cities like Turin an opportunity to breathe country air and to eat country food for a few weeks, and in addition to effect some good among the peasantry. The method adopted was typical of Don Bosco. A band at their head led the party, which would march into a village and make for the parish church, where the villagers, attracted by the music, came to discover what was afoot. Don Bosco would say a few words, telling of his plans of the next day's mass, when they were invited to make their communions. Then he would go to the confessional, where, often, he would be kept until eleven, or even midnight. In the meantime, his boys would be given a meal and put up at the presbytery or in the neighbouring manor, where, as often as not, clean straw awaited them in the loft. Next morning, they would provide the singing at Mass. Don Bosco would preach, and there would be many communions. After Mass and a meal, the boys would set about putting up a stage, under the trees, in the square perhaps, while others went around the village sticking bills announcing a concert for that night after Vespers. Don Bosco's boys seem always to have drawn a good house for their entertainments on these occasions. Once more he was putting into practice the experience of his childhood when, of a Sunday afternoon, he diverted the peasants of his own village, giving them religious instruction followed by recreation. These autumn excursions took place regularly from 1855 until 1865. When they had been established for some time, the railway company put two carriages at Don Bosco's disposal, and he was thus able to take his charges further afield, even Genoa and the Italian Côte d'Azur. Mentioning these autumn holidays, so well organised by Don Bosco, <coughs> Don Lemuin, one of his earlier biographies, speaks of the incalculable good that they effected, the many excellent pupils that, en route, Don Bosco obtained for his large establishment in Turin, the many sinners that through his ministry were reconciled with God, the many families to which peace was restored. Don Bosco was principally concerned with his own boys on these excursions, but he took the opportunity, as we have seen, to show the people of the Piedmont villages that religion was not the sombre affair 
that the influence of Jansenism had made of it. He was continuing and completing the work begun by Don Cafaso at the Convito in Turin, giving clear proof to the youth of the countryside that they were not neglected, that the aloof attitude of the clergy was not universal. The doctor who treated Don Bosco on his deathbed discovered this. What is more revealing than the remark that, as a small child, he made to his mother complaining that on the country roads of the neighbourhood priests did not even acknowledge his greeting. Don Bosco's whole existence was to be a living protest against this kind of conduct. To him, children and youth were all. He realised, in fact, the truth of those remarks about the education of the young, written hundreds of years beforehand by St. John Chrysostom. Suitably enough, they formed the homily read at Matins for Don Bosco's feast on January the 31st. Therefore, let us imitate the Lord and neglect nothing on behalf of our brethren, even of those who appear very humble and mean. But if there is also a need of our help, even though he to whom our help is to be given be small and abject, though the things we do seem to us hard and full of labour, all these things will seem more endurable and easier when done for the salvation of a brother. For God knows that the soul is worthy of so much earnestness and so much care that he did not spare his own son. If it is not enough for our salvation that we ourselves live virtuously, but it behoves us to desire in very truth the salvation of others, what shall we answer, seeing that we neither live rightly nor teach others? What hope of salvation will remain to us? What is nobler than to rule minds or to mould the character of the young? I consider that he who knows how to form the youthful mind is truly greater than all the painters, sculptors and all others of that sort. <laughs>